Good evening. It is such a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Faculty of Law to this very special evening. We're here to celebrate a very special person and beloved alumna, retired Supreme Court Justice Rosalie Silberman Abella. We're joined. We're joined by some very special guests who've come from far and wide to participate in this celebration, Justices Susanne Baer and Eleanor Kagan and Lord John Dyson, as well as Professor Stephen Toop. I'll say more about them in a moment, but I first wanted to say a few words about Rosalie Abella. Of course, I'm trying to say a few words. I'm by definition leaving out a lot, and I mean a lot. But since I'm, in a way, only the warm-up act, I think it's okay if I do that, uh, because we will have two days of conversation about Justice Abella's many, many contributions, and so I want to make just three points. First, Rosalie Abella, and that will not be news to anyone here, has blazed many trails through her decades as a judge, from her appointment to the Ontario Family Court at the age of 29, all the way to her appointment to the Supreme Court of Canada in 2004 as the first Jewish woman. To her work as a royal commissioner, as chair of the Ontario Labour Relations Board and chair of the Ontario Law Reform Commission, as a teacher, an author, and, 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 dot, dot, dot. Along the way, Rosie has also impacted many, many areas of law. We will hear about some of those today and tomorrow. A symposium over at the law faculty will explore the Honorable Rosalie Abella's work in the areas of labor, equality, and public law. And our main speakers tomorrow, and I believe some of them are here, uh, Professors Adele Blackett from McGill, Paul Daly from the University of Ottawa, and Martha Minow from Harvard University. Second point, throughout it all, Rosalie Abella has been motivated by the pursuit of justice and a steadfast, infectious belief in the power of individuals, institutions, and the law to be forces for the good. She's inspired generations of students and young lawyers to embrace their power to do justice. And it's wonderful to see so many of them here tonight. In fact, that's not quite true because I can't see you because the light is on me and it's very dark in the audience. But the main point is that Rosalie Abella has a remarkable ability to amplify her own considerable impact by inspiring others. Sidebar to the students who are here, listen tonight and tomorrow and remember what you see and hear as you pursue your path because you can be a multiplier and impact the world through the example you set in the way you engage with those around you, whatever area you end up working in. But back to Rosalie Abella. As I said, three points. So the third one is actually directly connected to what I just said. Aside from intellectual curiosity and brilliance, Rosie has been able to do what she has done because of a unique gift, humanity and friendship. These are gifts that she bestows on those who meet her. And my best guess is that this room is actually full of people, and I think we already had an inkling of this, who would call Rosalie Abella a friend, and to whom she has been and is a genuine friend. For when she says, my friend, she means it. I'm proud to say that the Honorable Rosalie Abella has also been a steadfast friend to the faculty from which she graduated in 1970. We're so delighted that upon her retirement from the Supreme Court, she returned home, as it were, as a distinguished visiting jurist, in which role she will continue to be engaged in our debates, connect with colleagues, and above all, with the students. Mentoring law students has always been a priority and passion for Rosie. It's no accident that she gifted her eclectic book collection, and eclectic meaning comprising everything from mystery novels to books about Broadway, to textbooks, to Margaret Atwood, to the students of the Faculty of Law. There's a wonderful reading area over in the Jackman Law Building, and the students um, delight in using it. To sum up, Rosalie Abella is a force of nature, and her impact has reached far beyond Canada as our roundtable theme, Justice Beyond Borders, and the participants attest. 
Similarly, her friendships reach far beyond Canada, and given what I've just said, it won't be a surprise to you to hear that each of our participant, participants is indeed a friend of Rosie. So let me now introduce him to you. Our moderator is Professor Stephen Toop, currently the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. He was previously Dean of the McGill Faculty of Law, the inaugural president of the Trudeau Foundation, the president of the University of British Columbia, and also the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs here at the university. I'm delighted to say that he is set to return to Toronto to take the helm of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research um, in the very near future. He's an influential and creative thinker, both as a scholar and an academic leader, and much more. Among many other things, um, he was the chair and rapporteur of the UN's Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances, in 2005, he served as a fact finder for the Commission of Inquiry into the actions of the Canadian government officials of Canadian government officials in relation to Meher Ra, a Canadian subjected to rendition to Syria from the United States. Stephen, thank you so much for moderating the conversation tonight. I'll now proceed in alphabetic order, it's just not, and we'll start with Justice Susanne Baer, who was elected to Germany's federal constitutional court in 2011 for a 12-year term, which is ending next year. And during this time, though, she has remained a professor of public law and gender studies at Humboldt University in Berlin. She's also at Humboldt University prior to obviously serving as justice, served as vice president for academic and international affairs, as dean for academic affairs at the law school, and as director of the Center for Transdisciplinary Gender Studies and the Gender Competence Center. Her academic interests include socio-cultural legal studies, feminist legal and gender studies, law against discrimination and comparative constitutional law. She's a distinguished academic indeed and was elected corresponding fellow of the British Academy in 2017. Welcome, Susanna. Lord John Dyson has had an illustrious judicial career and I can really only touch the tip of the iceberg here. He was master of the roles, which means president of the Court of Appeal of England and Wales and the head of civil justice for four years until he retired in 2016. He was a justice of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom from April 2010 until October 2012. In his long judicial career, which actually spanned two decades, so really I just touched the tip of the iceberg, he decided many cases across a whole range of civil law, including contract, construction, commercial law, general common law, international law, public law, human rights law, you name it. Prior to his work as a judge, he was a distinguished practitioner acting in many high profile cases. He was appointed QC in 1982. And if you fast forward to last year in May 2021, you might have read a thing or two about him because he submitted a fairly high profile report on the BBC's earlier internal probe into the now infamous, I think we can say 1995 interview with Diana, Princess of Wales. And last but most certainly not least, I am just delighted to welcome back Justice Elena Kagan to the University of Toronto and the Faculty of Law. She was most recently here in 2018 when she received an honorary doctorate from the university. After briefly practicing law in Washington, D.C. in a law firm, Justice Kagan became a law professor, first at the University of Chicago Law School and later Harvard Law School. She also served for four years in the Clinton administration as associate counsel to the president and then deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy. I'm tempted to say she has done it all because also between 2003 and 2009, she was the dean of the Harvard Law School. In 2009, President Obama nomina nominated her to be solicitor general of the United States and then a year later, he nominated her to be Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Welcome to you as well. Um, before I turn, uh, before I call up the first speaker to the podium, I just wanted to say a few words for, to thank the many, many people who devoted so much time and energy to the planning and organization of this event. I want to thank Robert Lines and the entire events team Assistant Dean Jennifer Lancaster, the Dean's Office staff, in particular Tomas Flecker and Bernadette Mound, 
And also a very, very special thanks to my colleagues, Professor Sophia Moreau and Carrie Rittick, who were instrumental in visioning this event, including in particular tomorrow's symposium. With that, I will leave you to what is bound to be a fascinating discussion, and I would ask Lord Dyson, please, to open it up with a few remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it is truly a great honor for me to have been invited to take part in this prestigious conference to celebrate the remarkable achievements of Justice Rosalia Bella. To me, and I gather to everybody else, she's Rosie and not Rosalie. We first met in London at a United Kingdom Canadian legal exchange at least 15 years ago. I remember it well. I was in the Court of, of Appeal at the time she had already been a justice of the Supreme Court of Canada for a number of years. It took little time for us to discover that we have very much in common. A shared love of classical music, a strong consciousness of our Jewish identity, and a passion for justice and judging. The return visit of the United Kingdom delegation was to Ottawa. No arrangements had been made to feed us on the first evening. Rosie didn't think much of that, so she invited us all to her apartment and rustled up a meal for us. How typical of her warmth, informality, and kindness. Over the years, we've shared platforms at legal events in various countries. Ones that stand out for me were the conference to mark the 70th anniversary of the establishing of the Supreme Court of Israel and the conference at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow in 2015 to mark the 70th anniversary of the start of the Nuremberg war crime trials, war crimes trials and the 80th anniversary of the passing of the hateful Nuremberg race laws. She spoke on both occasions. The subject of our panel discussion in Jerusalem was the independence of the judiciary. She broadened the subject out and gave a rousing and emotional address about Israel and human rights. The audience was spellbound. So too was the audience of members of my inn of court, the Middle Temple, who came to Canada on an amity visit. All of them were moved and some were actually reduced to tears by what she said. That speech is still talked about today in the Middle Temple. She is a wonderful speaker. Her passion and warmth shine brightly through everything she says, and yet it is always controlled. That is why she's so compelling and persuasive. It gave me enormous pleasure to call her to the bench of Middle Temple when I was treasurer in 2017. The Krakow speech was particularly emotional because her father had studied law at the Jagiellonian University and had wanted to practice law in Poland, but was prevented from doing so by the Nazis. Of course, she has a remarkable story to tell and others may touch on it too. She tells it brilliantly. She was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany in 1946 to a family, some of whom did not survive the Holocaust. She and her immediate family were allowed to enter Canada in 1950. Her meteoric rise through the court system here to the Supreme Court in 2004 is well known, as is her huge output of important judgments, which are suffused with her humanity, and many of them are notable for her fearlessness. I am not familiar with much Canadian jurisprudence, but I suspect, like my fellow pan panelists, I have read with admiration her magisterial judgment in Nevson and Araya powerful and principled. Despite this extraordinary public life, her family has remained of paramount importance to her. She was recently asked at a Middle Temple event what was the achievement of which she was most proud. Without hesitation, she answered, her two sons. She might also have answered that it was her marriage of 53 years to her lovely late husband, Ichi. He was so proud of her and would have loved to have been here. In the short time I have, I thought I would say a little, and very little indeed, about two topics. The first is the relationship between the domestic courts of the United Kingdom and the European Court of Human Rights. I do so be first because it provides an interesting illustration of the influence of foreign jurisprudence on domestic courts. 
and secondly, because it is a matter of current political con controversy in my country, and I understand it, it has achieved certain notoriety or certainly interest in this country too. Despite growing xenophobia, the United Kingdom remains a party to the European Convention on Human Rights and is therefore subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. The Human Rights Act of 1998 requires courts in the UK to take account of any relevant Strasbourg jurisprudence, but not necessarily to follow it. And this obligation has been interpreted to mean that the courts should normally follow any clear and constant jurisprudence of Strasbourg. In my view, this is sensible because a key reason for the 1998 Act was to enable litigants to have their convention claims decided in our domestic courts and not to have to go to Strasbourg to vindicate their convention rights. But for some time, there has been a growing chorus of voices, mainly on the right of our political spectrum, complaining about some of the Strasbourg decisions. The dissatisfaction has focused in particular on Article 8, the right to private and family life, and the use of that article to thwart attempts to deport foreign criminals, even if they have deep roots in the United Kingdom. I will say no more about that, because I think we may be touching on it in later, say, later discussions. But the fact is that our government uh, thinks that um, Strasbourg has gone too far uh, and wants to introduce new legislation to, to make a, a substantial change to our relationship with Strasbourg. Um, the relationship between our courts and the Strasbourg court continues to be a, a source of uh, friction. So the government's pro recent proposals were promulgated. They met with fierce opposition, and the government has recently announced that it is shelving them at any rate for the time being and will instead develop some more narrowly focused proposals. I'm sure that this story has by no means ended. The second topic I wish to, do, to touch on is how the jurisprudence of the courts of one state can and sometimes does influence that of another state. There are many examples of this, particularly in common law jurisdictions. And I just want to touch on two examples of, of this question of whether or not there should or should not be influence. They both involve Canadian decisions. The, the first is the, the decision which I expect many of you here are familiar with of Basley and Curry, in which the Supreme Court of Can Canada promulgated a new test based on considerations of policy and justice. And that was whether the tortious act was su sufficiently closely connected with the employee's employment to make it fair and just to fix the employment, the employer with vicarious liability for the tort of the employee. We had a, a case not long after that in our House of Lords, as it then was, called Lister and Hesley Hall. And in that case, Lord Stain, who, who gave the, probably the lead judgment, said that he had been much assisted by the, quote, luminous and illuminating judgments in Basley. The new approach to vicarious liability found favor, favor with Lord Stain and his colleagues, and our law was changed. The second example really goes the other way. The case of Nefson, which I've already referred, Justice Abella, speaking for the majority, gave a powerful judgment in which she explained why she declined to import the English law doctrine of act of state into Canadian law. She refused to do so because she said that it had led to confusion. She clearly did not like uh, introducing a confusing doctrine, um, uh, one which was in fact largely defined by its limitations. Secondly, although Canadian common law concerning the act of state doctrine had grown from the same roots as its English counterpart, it had developed its own approach to addressing the twin principles underlying the doctrine, namely conflict of laws and judicial restraint. So here we have two examples which vividly illustrate the way in which the judgments of courts of different jurisdictions sometimes influence each other and sometimes do not. I'm sure that in retirement, whether through her teaching or her writings, Rosie will have much to say on different aspects of justice beyond frontiers, as well as many other topics. Thank you very much.
Well, I feel honored. Actually, more than honored, but there ends my English, so honored. <laughs> and Lord Dyson mentioned that Rosie Bella has a passion for justice and judging, and I want to pick up on that. Because to me, Rosie Bella is the incarnation of what democratic constitutionalism is about, and first and foremost, constitutionalism in the protection of fundamental rights. And so when I prepared for this event, I thought about what can we learn from Rosie Abella? And I think it is the deep commitment to what has been coined as post-World War II constitutionalism. And what does that mean? To me, three points are of the utmost importance. One is there is no commitment to an empty formal rule of law. We had conversations where she actually reacted a little allergic to that very term, the rule of law. But at the same time, her commitment to a substantive notion of the rule of law is as deep as it can get. So against the formality of that notion, because that notion can be abused and committed to a substantive understanding of what the rule of law promises to people, particularly to substantive equality, meaningful liberty, and uncompromised dignity, that to me is the most important component of what Rosie Bella stands for. The second one, certainly and naturally, judicial review of legislation. I have heard of countries where this is still controversial. Well, to people committed to post-World War II constitutionalism, it cannot be. The charter, I think Rosie Bella once called, is a noble risk taken and a triumph for justice because it sets limits on even elected majorities when those majorities disregard individuals. And individuals are the ones to be taken care of necessarily, eventually, if so, by a court. So that understanding of judicial review is a natural ingredient of constitutionalism to be you know, handled carefully and wisely, but a natural ingredient is to me the second com component that is important. The third one is a, what I would call a holistic understanding of fundamental rights. No liberty in isolation, no equality on another planet and no dignity out there, but all of them taken together. Fundamental rights in a combination on the ground. Recommended reading on those three points. The Royal, as I call it by now, Abella Commission Report on Equality in Employment. I read it, and I do recommend it to you. It's from 1984, and I was struck by the clarity of the analysis, the avant-garde in vision, and the groundedness in the realities of people out there. The Commission Report, and that is a very interesting feature, was based on listening to people, not knowing at all, but listening to people. Thousands of letters, hundreds of meetings, an open ear to people who know best what their lives look like, and then collecting this and taking this to others to give them a voice. Second, looking beyond borders, our topic today. In that report, there's not only a comparative assessment of United States developments, but there's a very strong and quite natural call for human rights institutions to take on employment matters. That is a step to take from employment, local, you know, to human rights institutions out there. And that was the step taken in that report. And then what I would call radically pragmatic. The report is based on a look beyond borders to the United States, and since it didn't want to get into that trouble around affirmative action, it simply renamed that by saying, let's call it employment equity and go for that one. And it says, almost verbatim, you know, big principles don't suffer from being renamed. So if it's employment equity in this country and people, you know, avoid the affirmative action troubles, let's do that one. And I think, as far as I know, she coined a term there. In addition, finally, in that report, the Abella Royal, whatever you want to call it, you know, Royal Abella, whatever, Royal Abella report, she was very avant-garde looking at it from a standpoint of gender studies and the analysis of equality and anti-discrimination law today. Because it was, the commission wanted her to talk about basically women and gender 
employment, in employment, but also at native people, the disabled, and visible minorities. And she didn't put them in four different boxes, but looked at them as an experience in life that comes together in a variety of individuals, which we by now call intersectional or multidimensional inequalities. It is, in fact, striking, and I mean it, read it. Recommended reading number two. I cannot maybe say it properly, but Saskatchewan, 2015. There is a ruling in the Supreme Court, she by now kind of changed position, but followed the same path, Saskatchewan ruling in 2015 on the right to strike by public employees. And this is also a step to take. First, employment matters as constitutional law fundamental rights questions. This does not come naturally to everyone, but she did that. And I almost quote from the ruling, it is a case about rights that empower vulnerable groups. A term now very fashionable in human rights jurisprudence, but early on in that ruling, covering not a distinct identity question or something like that, but the vulnerability of socioeconomic poverty risks on the ground. That is striking about that ruling. The rights are making possible a more equal society because they affirm the dignity and autonomy of employees in their working lives. They do not guarantee an outcome, but they permit negotiations on an equal footing. Well, I recommend reading the whole thing. It's really worth your attention. So, what are we to do with this today? And why is this so urgently needed, that commitment to the post-World War II consensus, that holistic understanding, that down-to-earth, listening-to-people approach to jurisprudence? It is, I think, as relevant as ever. The post-World War II consensus erodes by the minute. It is attacked around the world. It has been destroyed in some places already. And even more complicated, in some places it is captured and abused by still going with the same name, yet not deserving that label anymore. In the European Union, I refer the examples of Hungary and of Poland are striking, and they're not alone. There are more countries by now. And what, what is featured in those developments is not a critique of court or criticism of some judgments or a feeling that maybe that court went too far in this particular ruling, but it is attacks attacks on the very institutions out there. And last night in this law school, Lady Hale from the British Supreme Court described the United Kingdom debates around this and quoted many politicians and prominent academics that join these attacks um, as there are people in the United States, people in Germany, people throughout Europe, people in Latin America, people in African countries that do so. They are well-funded, they are media savvy, they are corrupt, they are unashamed, they're populist autocrats around the world who are out to undo the post-World War II compromise. This is why what Rosie Bella teaches us matters so urgently in this world. We see withdrawals from human rights treaties in Russia and Turkey and in other countries. We see reservations to human rights treaties, that is, human rights window dressing, you sign the treaty, but then you put a ton of reservations on there so it doesn't do anything on the ground, most prominently done with the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and no, we are not surprised. Um, and we have silencing uh, around matters of fundamental rights protection in that courts, more and more courts, refuse to refer to international law and human rights law in their arguments or use comparative arguments in their rulings. So from a German, European, continental law point of view, but joined by many courts around the world from common law and continental law, civil law backgrounds, I propose a rosy approach to these issues, which I call embedded constitutionalism. Not only post-World War II democratic constitutionalism committed to the protection of fundamental rights, but a constitutionalism which has today be to be embedded in a kind of global approach, a transnational, a beyond borders approach to justice. What does that mean? We start with national law for sure. As judges, we swear our oath to the national constitution, to the national commitments. That's 
you know, the starting point. But we have to take into account international obligations and we have to join a global conversation among courts. Look at the issues out there. Climate, COVID, terrorism, migration, information, data, including hate speech and manipulated elections, trade, the war, all of these call for embedded constitutionalism, a strong commitment to, yes, do your thing in your country, but look beyond borders. So this is one way to take Rosie Bella into the future. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll uh, second Justice Bear in saying it's an honor to be here. And when um, I was asked to be here, I was told that this was going to be a session in honor of Justice Abella and her retirement, and it was going to be about various transnational issues and particularly the question of how judges in one country might influence or not judges in another country. So I thought I would um, just start by saying a bit about Justice Abella's view, since this is about Justice Abella on her retirement, Justice Abella's view of the retirement practices of different <laughs> Supreme Courts. <laughs> so I have here an article, and I don't know where it's from actually. My clerk dug, dug this up, and did not tell me where it was from. <laughs> um, but it's an interview with Justice Abella that she did recently after she left the court. And the interviewer said to her, if the rules were different and justices didn't have to retire at 75, would she serve for 10 more years? She said, well, let's dissect that. This is a quote, because that's a very interesting question. Is it a good idea to have rules that say, when a judge has a sell-by date and it's time to move and make room for someone else and get fresh blood on the court, and I think you can tell from my answer how I feel about that. <laughs> I think it's crucial to be able to have a stage where we're told, thank you very much, but it is really time for someone else to come in. And then she continued, there are other jurisdictions, Sabella says, where there is often an inability to say this is the right time to go. Well, other jurisdictions. <laughs> Why be cagey? Shh. That, that was the journalist, honestly. That wasn't Justice Abella. She amends her remark, quote, another jurisdiction. <laughs> the U.S., she says, Several of the judges left well past when they were comfortable doing their jobs. Now really, what she meant was when they were able doing their jobs, right? I mean, comfortable. We're all comfortable doing... <laughs> so I love our system, continued Justice Abella, where we know when it's time for us to leave. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, I mean Justice Abella is like sort of a piker, you know, 17 years, 75. My predecessor, 35 years, 90. <laughs> the last four vacancies that we've had, uh, all justices who have served more than 25 years. And um, apparently we're not listening to Canadian law on this, you know? <laughs> Although perhaps, uh, perhaps we should. Um, Actually, I mean, this, these remarks, this is kind of what I love about Rosie. Uh, this funny, tell it like you see it brand of legal commentary is what she brings to everything. Um, and uh, in this case, she might even be right. <laughs> but that's what uh, drew me to Rosie. Now, um, you might say, well, where did you meet Rosie? And, or how did you first learn of Rosie? And I know that the proper thing to say is that I've been reading Rosie Abella opinions from the time I went to law school. 
um, because she is a really famous Supreme Court justice, you know, not just in Canada. I want to say this. There's a colleague of mine in the United States. I was the dean at Harvard, and he was the dean at Yale, and he once said of Roshi, she is the most famous Supreme Court justice in the world. Um, but, but remember that I'm an American judge, and we don't actually read foreign judges' opinions. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm always, <laughs> like sometimes we pretend to at conferences like this one, <laughs> but mostly not even that. So, um, I mean, I know Rosie Abella sort of invented equality, you know, but that's about what I knew about her. I first got to know Rose, Rosie at um, a conference that Yale does every year, Yale Law School, brings together judges and justices from all over the world. And the second best thing about this conference is that Justice Bear is always there. But uh, the first best thing about this conference is that Justice Abella is always there. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how I got to know Rosie. And what I discovered was a person of enormous warmth and generosity and humor, a kind of joie de vivre, just a sort of bringing of joy to everything. I think everybody who knows Rosie will know what I mean when I say that Rosie has heart. Of course, she also has mind. And over the years now, I have read her opinions, and they reflect a brilliant intellect, a person of very deep and wide-ranging knowledge, a person of great analytic rigor, uh, a gift for the written word. And it's the combination of the two things, I think, that is Rosie Abella's secret sauce. The personality and the intellect combined to produce a judge who I would say has a kind of rare charisma, a sort of judicial magnetism. So when the, um, the announcement for this program says that Rosie Abella has been an ambassador for Canadian values and jurisprudence, I think this is why it is that there, she brings the sort of judicial magnetism that everybody wants to be with Rosie. Everybody wants to uh, emulate Rosie. Uh, and uh, everybody wants to follow Rosie wherever she's going. And I'm going to make what uh, some of you in the audience might find to be a crazy and provocative comparison. But in this respect, uh, Rosie Abella reminds me of one of my former colleagues. I mean, Rosie herself might hate this. I mean, she, I, she's smiling now, but, um, uh, but probably the most influential American justice of the last quarter or half century. Um, and that is Justice Nina Scalia. Uh, I think Rosie is sort of the progressive Nino Scalia. <laughs> and I mean that as an enormous compliment because the two of them both combined this kind of uh, over the top but like wonderful personality, this warmth and generosity and humor and com combined it with this extraordinary brilliance to create a judge of extraordinary influence, a judge to be reckoned with. Uh, and that's why, as I said before, she's the world's most famous Supreme Court justice. Now, a measure of Rosie's generosity is that she approved my attendance here. <laughs> because truth be told, Rosie and I are not the same kind of judge. So, um, Here's another article. This one actually has a source. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't even bring the source. It's the, uh, the Toronto, what is the Toronto paper called? Globe and Mail. It's from the Toronto Globe and Mail. And there's a long interview with Rosie here, too. And it says, uh, there are two, two kinds of judges in the world. 
Are, are they cautious incrementalists or bold change makers? And then it says there's little doubt about where Justice Abella stands. Now I think that this is kind of skewing the question a little bit, but honestly, I'm an incrementalist. <laughs> Justice Abella is a change maker. Uh, and uh, that's, I mean, so why, I mean, I, I spend all my life thinking about how to constrain justices, judges, including some of my colleagues. <laughs> um, how to prevent judges from just making the world over in their own images. Uh, which often, in the American context, means reflecting um, very particular uh, ideologies and sometimes bringing the world back to some preferred time in the past. Um, uh, and much more than Rosie, I would defer to democratic processes of decision making while insisting on the role of the courts to support the processes of democracy, including the conditions of equality that are necessary for a democratic, uh, for a democracy to function. But um, this brings me to sort of, I suppose, my uh, most serious point of the day, which is that this difference between the two of us, sort of my insistence on following precedent and going slow and not doing more than is necessary and on courts being more like common law courts than they are like grand constitutional uh, 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 decision makers. Um, uh, and it, it, it makes me think that justice is so dependent on national context and national history and national sources of law. So, when I come to conferences like this, I always feel a little bit like the skunk at the garden party. <laughs> but uh, it does seem to me that even among liberal democracies, I am uh, not very sure that judges of different national traditions really have that much to say to each other. That our constitutions are different, our histories, both pre and post ratification are different. Our lines of precedent are different. And with it all, it strikes me that it is not at all surprising that judging is different and that what would work in Canada may not work in the United States and vice versa. So now I read all of, uh, I, ha I think I have read all of Justice Abella's major opinions, but I do so to appreciate fine writing, to appreciate magnificent thinking, to watch a vigorous and wide-ranging intellect pursue what she calls the rule of justice. But I don't do so with any expectation or intention of adopting her way of judging as my own. <laughs> Sorry, Rosie. Thank you so much. The three of you have set the stage for a, a conversation we have about half an hour. Um, I, I'd love to pick up where, where you just concluded, uh, Justice Kagan. Uh, you, you are very bold in saying, you know, we don't read foreign judgments. And, and it's interesting, uh, the, the person that you compared Justice Abella to, Justice Scalia, had, was very uh, powerful on exactly that subject. I, I'm wondering if I, if I could just continue. Do you think that part of that is also a, a sense that relates to the incrementalism that you talked about, that, that if, you, if you have sources that are just too wide ranging, that it's gonna be hard to keep that common law tradition of judging uh, stable and uh, compelling within a national jurisdiction. Yeah, I actually don't think it has much to do with that because okay. this sort of uh, what you might call in a pejorative word, parochialism or what I, uh, uh, is, is, is pretty common across other judging philosophies uh, in the United States. Um, 
Uh, so it applies, you know, the, the, the incrementalists don't spend a lot of time reading foreign judgments, and the activists or the more uh, aggressive uh, judges don't spend a lot of time reading foreign judge, uh, judgments. So I don't think it has much to do with that. I mean, it might have something to do with sort of American exceptionalism and, mm -hmm. and uh, which people know in a lot of different guises. But I think it has, uh, it's fundamentally, and, and look, I, I mean, I don't want to make this a kind of like, we will never read a foreign judgment, <laughs> because I, I don't think that that's um, sensibly what the position is. I mean, the, I mean at least I'll just, I'll just speak for myself, and I think that there are probably uh, colleagues you know, on either side of me, but in a fairly narrow range, honestly, um, it, it was, it was, um, it was a kind of dispute among American justices for a while until people sort of thought like, maybe we're not really disagreeing with each other all that much. Because um, I think what most uh, American justices would say is like, we're fine on reading things to see what other people are doing and to get ideas and to think about the way other, other countries and other justices approach law. Um, uh, and just like we're fine like reading law review articles, right? To get various academics' views on how the law should develop. And, um, and so I, I don't think many of us are like blinders we refuse to learn from anybody. I just think that most of us are, you know, we've, we have a, uh, uh, right, you, you know, a, I don't know how it compares when I'm sitting next to like, like you know, somebody whose country has been around for a whole lot longer, but, but you know, uh, a, 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 a 250 years of legal tradition, precedent, ways of doing things, and it's kind of hard enough to figure out how to make sense of that entire history without thinking about, you know, like, let's, uh, let, let's do something from mm. Uh, uh, countries with very different histories, traditions, um, uh, seismic events of their own. Justice Baird, though, you were worried about uh, countries in Europe perhaps no longer being as willing to look at comparative law sources uh, in, your, in your comments. Uh, that has certainly happened in, in various parts of the continent. But do you think that that's partly because you're sitting on a constitutional court uh, and that there is then a different pattern of judging. It was suggested, I think, by Justice Kagan that that might be the case. There are certainly differences between the approach of a constitutional court compared to a regular Supreme Court, but then there are Supreme Courts with constitutional obligations. So when they face constitutional matters as constitutional matters, I think it's similar. So I, so I don't take that as a defining difference. But I think in this conversation, uh, we, 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 we need to distinguish between the use of comparative material as illuminating, inspiring, interesting, never as authority, because I think the South African Constitution has a mandate yes. for that court to use them as authority, but yet not binding authority of the same level as their own jurisprudence. So that, that is not our issue. Um, and the uses of comparative uh, law and international law or the application of international law in different national contexts, which we have to take into account in certain cases simply by, 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 because of the legal mandate. And my argument was to uh, the necessity to take those into account to develop a consistent, coherent, um, persuasive uh, approach to problems which, are, which know no borders. So if we face a problem that knows no borders, then I, as a member of a court, addressing that very problem have to at least know and take into account, and that's a very you know, non-binding yet interested and active way of, of, of dealing with this, to have to take into account how others deal with this, because otherwise my answer to a problem will be an isolated little intervention, but not part of a broader consensus building effort to really uh, find the answers adequate for today. We'll come back to international law and, it, and its potential, uh, I suppose, incorporation or automatic application within national systems. But, but Lord Dyson, I know that you're more generally interested in the question of persuasion. What is it that 
actually judges take from varieties of sources uh, as fodder for their own process of reflection and interpretation. How, how do you think that process best works? How, do you, how open would you be to a wide diversity of sources? Well, at the Supreme Court level, and even at one tier below, I think, uh, certainly I felt that I was always open to any source that seemed to be relevant and of high quality. Uh, it, had to be, it had to be relevant, and of course, if you weren't interested in looking at jurisprudence from a, um, a, 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 a country whose laws and whose cultures and so on were totally different from one's own, but in a common law system, uh, we certainly frequently uh, look at what the, the leading common law jurisdictions have to say on the topic that you're, under, you're considering, like and Australia, New Zealand, uh, and Canada are the prime examples. And um, what does one get from it? You, uh, first of all, of course, on the whole, in our system, we rely upon the material that is placed before us by the advocates. We, um, uh, so, and that's critical. And so the, the, uh, you do rely upon the advocates and you hope that they're up to the job. If they're not, then you have to start doing some research of your own. But that's not really how our system works. And um, we are um, in, a, in a case which involves some difficult, maybe novel issue, novel for our jurisdiction. We look at all sorts of things. Uh, if there is um, a, a leading decision in Canada or Australia or wherever, which is actually on the point, um, we are very interested in looking at that. And, and as to how persuasive it is, it depends on, on, the, on the quality of the, the reasoning. And that is absolutely critical. And, and thinking about this, I, I was put in mind of a case I had when I think I was, I wasn't in the Supreme Court at the time, but the issue was whether a hot air balloon was an aircraft for the purposes of the Warsaw uh, Carriage Convention. Uh, and there were, we, were, we were shown a decision of the Cour de Cassation from France. And it was, a, it was just two sentences. I can't remember which way it went, it doesn't matter, but it was just two sentences. And it was completely useless as far as we were concerned <laughs> because we did not know what the reasoning was. So um, it's all about the quality of the reasoning. And I, I agree with you that the, uh, there is no magic in, in the uh, decisions coming out of the High Court of Australia or the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, rather than a brilliant piece by some academic, whether in our country or somewhere else. It's all to do with the quality of the reasoning. And as to what it is that persuades you about the reasoning, I, th I think that's, that's difficult. What is, the, what is it that causes people to, be, to accept what is being submitted to you. And that can be in all sorts of contexts, not just in the law, but in life. But it is, there are some, some people who have the ability to write and indeed to express themselves orally in a way which is so compelling and attractive that you get, you, you can get carried away. I mean, some of the best advocates are the most dangerous advocates because they, they uh, they may have hopeless cases, but they put them in an extremely attractive, persuasive way. And I've had cases where I've listened to this brilliant argument, and I've had steps in, in the chain of the argument leading to a conclusion, which I've just said to myself, this cannot be right, but at the moment I can't see what's wrong with the steps of the reasoning. <laughs> so I had to go away and tile around my head and work it out, and usually I've been able to find a, find a flaw in the chain. But so the quality of the reasoning, the quality of the presentation, we're all human beings and we are susceptible to being persuaded. But that's, the quality of, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go I ahead, mean, the quality of reasoning, that sounds very abstract. When, when I pick up a set of briefs, of course you're right that we read first and mostly what the advocates give us. And uh, you know, in the it, it, Supreme Court briefs are, are, have are loaded with citations to other American Supreme Court cases, you have a fair amount of uh, reference to uh, uh, American academic work, and have almost no 
um, uh, foreign sources. And, and I think that the advocates are making a perfectly sensible choice because they think that those won't move us as much. And the reason it won't move us as much is not because those are less well-reasoned. I might, there might be foreign sources that are brilliantly reasoned, but they're reasoned in a particular way, embedded in a particular um, you know, set of precedents, in a particular kind of tradition, in a particular set of ideas that just might not have any relationship to how American courts, and especially the American Supreme Court, thinks about an issue. So yeah, if we were starting from scratch, that would seem like kind of a great idea. It seems very persuasive in the abstract. It just has nothing to do with what we do here. But it all depends, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, 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 sorry. To slightly disagree uh, with the uselessness claim regarding the French judgments, I have to say that the French are very short at times and we are very, very long. But um, nonetheless, um, when a national court is faced with the question, is a hot air balloon an aircraft? And there's an international convention regulating that point. You don't want to be an outlier to, outlier to the assessment of that very case. Because if the British or whoever says it's an aircraft and the rest of the world says it's not, we get a problem. Okay, so and I'm so going to say that that's with different. Aircraft. I know. That if and you're that, interpreting an international treaty, exactly. of course you want to know how exactly. other countries exactly. interpret the same treaty. You're all exactly. participants so, so in the same enterprise. Where we have to know what other countries do because you're in the same enterprise, right? The other one, the looking at other rulings from other countries when it's not legally necessary um, because it's not the same norm you're applying um, is a more difficult case. And we all agree it's not authority, the comparative stuff. But what I, what I note is that we, we, do, we do not distinguish as much anymore between common law and civil law, continental law countries. We read New Zealand, Australia, Canada, United States, etc. And it's striking to me that uh, small European countries do that. Certainly, the German court does that for very particular, including historical reasons, because also our constitution starts with a commitment to join a global community of democratic states, which after 1945 was a sheer necessity and, and the never again to the, the, the atrocities in the past. Yet, I think it's noteworthy that many European courts, African courts, Asian courts, and Latin American courts do not work anymore with this world of the common law there, or not as much, and this other world not publishing in English regularly there. And, and I think that is interesting, because with, with my argument saying we need to know what these others do if we want to join a conversation and a commitment and a fight to defend the very basis we're based on, and then in varieties. There are varieties of constitutionalism, but the very basic point, constitutionalism, democracy, fundamental rights, is on all of us. If we want to join that conversation and defend these very systems we're based on, I think we have to take note of each other and engage each other. So what we sometimes do, just one more sentence, is we simply, we simply refer to and select a common law case and a continental law case and some other case, to back our arguments up, yes, to back them up, because for them it's important to be able to show we are in the community of courts around the world, and not to, you know, bow to that authority, but to make that claim a stronger claim, because we live in a globalized world. Lord Dyson, just a moment, if you would, and then I want to move on to explore a little more about international law, per se, because it's now come up directly. Lord yeah. Dyson. I'd just like to respond to Elena's point. Um, I fully accept that you have to have regard to the context. Uh, so there's no question of a, a sort of slavishly following the jurisprudence of one country because it happens to be on the point. If the environment of that, jur that jurisprudence is completely different from one's own. So context is, is very important. But there are lots of cases, I think, and certainly in our system, where uh, the courts have actually looked at and, and adopted the reasoning of other jurisdic jurisdictions. I gave the example of the vicarious liability in the Canadian case. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was, which was, you know, a, a game changer. It changed our law. Um, that 
And I'll just give you one other example, because I do think that giving examples brings things to life. Um, I was on a, a judicial um, a legal exchange to Israel a number of years ago, and it was led by Lord Stain, who was the judge who actually uh, decided that vicarious liability case I mentioned. And it may be interesting that Lord Stain, he, he came from South Africa, so he may have had a slightly different view of the world from homegrown Brits, but that's, a, that's another matter. But we had a, a very interesting discussion. This is maybe 15 years ago um, about proportionality. At a time when proportionality was simply uh, barely on the horizon in our jurisprudence, it was accepted that it was relevant to look at proportionality in human rights cases and in EU cases. But on the domestic scene, nobody talked about proportionality. And I don't think it's even been fully embraced even today. But I remember, because it was so striking, that um, Barak, uh, uh, Aaron Barak, who was a brilliant chief justice of the Supreme Court of Israel, gave a speech. And he was talking about proportionality. And Johann Stein said that he was completely struck by the, the power of the reasoning. He said he was sitting on a judgment that he was writing and he was wrestling with. Um, and he was going to think very seriously about what Barak had said. And true enough, a couple of months later, the judgment came out. I can't remember what the case was. And he had made massive changes to that judgment to reflect and take account of what he had learnt from Barak. Now, it's just an example, but... Well, let me I mean... give you a counter-example. <laughs> and it's the, same, it's the same example, really. So I have a colleague, or, or, or had, uh, my good friend Justice Breyer, who went to a lot of um, international yeah. conferences and was very struck by the idea of proportionality yeah. and came back and started writing about proportionality, particularly in the context of the First Amendment, which is our free speech clause. And it was, um, I'm just going to say, it sounded foreign. It just didn't sound like what American judges sound like when they talk about free speech. And this is not necessarily because it was wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be if you were starting from scratch that you would think that this was a genius idea. It might be. But uh, to his colleagues' ears, it sounded like something that didn't yeah, people, American courts have been talking about free speech law for 100 years, and this just wasn't the language in which they spoke. Lord Dyson talked earlier about uh, the Nevson case, where Justice Sabella was writing for a bare majority of uh, the Supreme Court, concluding that customary international law forms part of Canadian law, and that was based on, on prior decisions, but then going on to conclude that that could produce a private right of action for violations of international custom. Quite interesting. Probably the kind of uh, moving forward with law that you, you were uh, commenting upon, uh, Justice Kagan. Let me quote, though, from that uh, judgment. Canadian courts, like all courts, play an important role in the ongoing development of international law. They implement international law, that's the importation of custom, but they also advance it and in doing so contribute to the choir of domestic court judgments around the world shaping the substance of international law, end quote. So is that the sort of thing you're talking about, Justice Baer, where, where the courts, you, you talked about the courts wanting to participate in that post-war settlement, if I may put it that way, but I think Justice Sabella is also saying that domestic courts have an obligation to help to create an advance in international law. Absolutely. Every contribution to that famous conversation among courts, or in this case, a musical person speaking, the choir uh, of, of, of courts uh, around the globe, um, is advancing the very cause. And, and, and not to be shy about that, it's also claiming a voice in that conversation. I mean, you can leave the development of international law and fundamental rights doctrine and the very uh, fundamental beliefs to somebody else out there, but that's not why people put you on the bench of the highest court in your country. So if you're in the highest court in your country, I think there is a certain obligation, a calling also, to join that global conversation because courts are in that way talking to each other. This judgment has been read, I guess, around the world. We certainly took it up. 
same as I think the, to add another example because they give kind of kind of the, the, the substance to our conversation in in a recent climate judgment we took on climate change. Um, on the Paris Agreement, which is an international agreement, we did not want to make this little German something remark, but we wanted to join a global conversation of what to do with these norms uh, countries committed themselves to and how to advance them in a cautious, somewhat incremental way actually, because we're only a court and we're not the legislature and we're not the ones to sign the next version of the treaty, but it's the same the same spiel, you, you, you try to you try to have a voice based on a no, an, on knowledge of the other voices out there and be cautious because you're, you're only one country in that world, but you want to contribute to, to that effort. Lord, Absolutely. Lord, thank you. Lord Dyson, do you think that members of the UK Supreme Court imagine themselves as contributing to that formation of international law, contributing to that global conversation? Well, I suspect not. Um, and Sounds so, like you think, but they should. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but, uh, but certainly the current incumbents of the court are a pretty cautious lot. They're taking their cue from the president, who's a very cautious person. Uh, his predecessor, who we heard give that brilliant lecture yesterday, uh, might have looked at things rather differently. I think, in fact, she was, she was almost discreet yesterday, but she, I was making it quite clear, she rather views with a certain amount of dismay the direction the court is going. So I, I, I don't see this as likely to happen in the foreseeable future. Justice Kagan, I assume that the argument would be that U.S. Associate Justices, Chief Justice, don't really imagine their role that way. I don't think they do. I mean, we, 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 uh, when, we, when we do international law issues, what does a treaty mean? Of course, we do international law. And we also look, uh, we were talking about this earlier, about the child abduction treaty and some recent cases uh, that came out differently in Britain and the United States. But the American Supreme Court looked very conscientiously at you know, how does every, every country you know, uh, uh, interpret this treaty? And we went with the majority position. It also struck us as the better one. Um, so we do that as a matter of course, but do we think of ourselves as kind of contributing to a grand international law conversation? No, we, we, I, I think sort of nobody does. Um, and, and, and I guess I would say too that I, I think it would be fairly common, and look, we disagree on our court about all kinds of things. We are in constant disagreement with each other, but I, I doubt that much of what I'm saying would strike any of my colleagues as, I mean, they would say it in different ways and maybe they would be, would say it more assertively or maybe they would put a few more caveats on. But on these issues, I doubt that there's, it, it, there's just a pretty narrow frame that, um, that I think w we all see uh, Congress as being the party that gets to decide how international law plays in United States law, if you will. Mm -hmm. So like we would look to a particular statute to say, is there a cause of action right. um, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the context of the opinion that you referenced? On a related but separate uh, topic, uh, a number of you referred to, a couple of you referred to questions around judicial review and its sort of political uh, authenticity, uh, a sense of authority. Uh, Lord Dyson, you talked about the Human Rights Act, uh, and that was very much tied, I think, to some arguments that were being made by certain portions of the UK uh, populace around the impropriety of judicial review. Uh, we've had comments like that uh, coming out of Europe, and of course there's always a perennial topic in the United States about the scale of judicial power, etc. Is that a topic on which courts in advanced democracies, very well-established courts, could and should be trying to work together to uphold a notion of the importance of the role of the judiciary in constitutional democracies? You clearly said yes, I think, to that. Well, when the Hungarian court was dismantled and when the Polish court was 
first destroyed and then captured, there was a call for help by these courts. There are world organizations and regional organizations where these courts meet and where they wanted help from an international community to pressure, to join the political pressure, to pressure their governments and to strengthen the voice of the people out there who wanted their court back. And so this was not something we kind of thought like, oh, let's intervene. <laughs> but it was something we were asked to do. They were pleading us to do. And I would like to, to comment on, on, on Justice Kagan's point. And people are also, they, need, they wish for the American Supreme Court, which was the outpost there and still is in a lot of legal education and for the whole development of constitutional law and fundamental rights protection in the world, they want that court out there to join that conversation. So the only thing is I can encourage all of you uh, to contribute to that. No, and, and I mean it because elites in all countries around the world are going to American law schools. Many go to Canadian law schools as well, and I encourage them to do so too. But the tone around the world is still set in English and very much based on American ideas and jurisprudence, which is a great idea. But since the world now is a global enterprise and we are all in it together, th th there is, I think, a craving almost for contributions in that regard. And I know that many of you do this because, be because you, you talk to us here. <laughs> um, but but to, to make that even a, a stronger point in those conversations. So courts around the world which are attacked, not criticized, criticism is fine, attacked because of the simply doing judicial review they're tasked with, need that backup. There also, one little additional point is a, a productive exchange, if one can call it that, in those conversations among courts, about the ways to handle judicial review. Judicial review is something, something we're tasked with, but there needs to be a wise, wise handling of, the, of that power. And I learned a lot, my colleagues learned a lot. I think many justices around the world, and I learned it from Rosie Bella, so that's the best teacher you can get, but there, there, but there, there are other people out there like Aaron Bach and many others where you can, you can Look at how did they do it? How did they react to criticism? How did they react to the activism uh, reproach, et cetera, et cetera, to understand what is in the institutional politics, the institutional wisdom you need to apply in cases beyond your legal brain uh, to, to, to not only survive, but to also demonstrate to people why these courts are needed in that very particular function. Lord Dyson, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, in the, the UK is in a different position, I think, from most other jurisdictions because the courts do not have the power to strike down legislation. Mm -hmm. the, the nearest they can get to it is to declare statutes as be incompatible with uh, human rights uh, under the, uh, the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, and... In, in substance, or in, in substance, if they do grant declarations of incompatibility, so far the government has always tended to come to heel and change the law to come into line. So, uh, in, in, uh, I suppose in, in practice, they have the power to do that, but they, they, they do not have the power to strike down legislation. And it's always open to Parliament to, to, to say, well, we hear what you say, but we're not, we're not budging. Justice Kagan, any comments? Yeah, this strikes me as a great example of how there are just limits to talking to each other. <laughs> I mean, it, is, it would be unthinkable in Britain to say, oh, a court can just willy-nilly go around striking down legislation in a way that it would be unthinkable in the United States to say the courts don't have that power. And one isn't better than the other, and we're not going to learn all that much by talking to each other about it. We're just going to decide that we have different traditions and different histories, and that what's thinkable in, uh, you know, in, in, in one country is the opposite in the other. And, and when, I th when I think about American disputes over how assertive that power of judicial review should be, it's all based on moments in American constitutional history. And it's based on uh, what people think of as high points and low points of American precedent. 
And, and it's, it's a completely contextualized judgment, or it's a judgment that you draw from your reading of American history, of the American context in the present, um, uh, that, that you, you know, exactly how restrained or how assertive other countries are, it's like, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I think that probably explains why, in my experience, it was very unusual for anyone to cite American authorities to us, and then why, no doubt, nobody bothers to cite our jurisprudence to you. I think the states in the UK are in one situation, but the other common law countries are in a different position. We could go on for a long time this evening and have a very robust conversation about related topics, but I do want to give an opportunity for uh, Justice Sabella to say a few words if she would like to do so before I have to turn over to the Dean of the University of Toronto Law School to close out the evening. <laughs> Welcome to my bar mitzvah. <laughs> Has there ever been so much hugging in the Isabel Bader Theater? It's Victoria <laughs> College, I mean. Well, I wasn't going to speak tonight because I am speaking later at the dinner, but when we met earlier before the session started, Elena Kagan said, you, you really have to speak. And I thought, okay, once in my life, I'm gonna follow the American Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did apply Scalia once. It was a decision that I wrote with two of my favorite colleagues on the Court of Appeal in a case called Tesling. And the issue was the FLIR jets that, that uh, have infrared and can see inside homes. And we decided unanimously, following a dissent of Scalia's, that you needed a warrant because it was a search. The first week I got to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Supreme Court unanimously overturned my decision. <laughs> and that was the last time I ever cited <laughs> Tony Scalia. So what, what to gain from all of this? I think you will see uh, something the public never really gets to see. I mean, the obvious, judges are people. Uh, my friends happen to be judges who are wonderful people. I'm so lucky that I've discovered them because I have learned so much from people I agree with and people I don't agree with. When I did the Royal Commission, there was only one jurisdiction that had studied, that had an equality constitutional principle that had been applied in jurisprudence, and it was the American 14th Amendment. I read every decision under the 14th Amendment to try to get a handle on how to think for Canada about equality. And I hated it so much <laughs> that I thought similarly situated, treating everybody the same, really? So if you're pregnant, you're treated like somebody who's not, and if you're uh, not able-bodied, you can't get a ramp because an able-bodied doesn't get it. We need something different, and besides, we have the French and English backgrounds, so we're much more comfortable with group rights, and uh, we accept difference as part of our constitutional bargain. So I made up a brand new, <laughs> I do that. I made up a brand, <laughs> a brand new approach to equality because of what I read and didn't agree with. And it, it reminded me that Isaiah Berlin was right when he said there's no pearl without some irritation in the oyster sometimes. So, I don't think I've ever had a case in the Supreme Court where I have not asked my law clerks to tell me what the American jurisprudence is, what the uh, British jurisprudence is, Australia, German, 
um, European Court of Human Rights, Israeli, South Africa, whatever democratic courts they can find, I want to read. Not because I want to follow it, but because these are smart people who have spent their lives thinking about what justice means in their context. And even if I decide not to apply it, it's informative, it stretches the mind to think about law differently, knowing where it comes from, to think about life differently, politics differently. It's very, it makes you humble to know it's not just about you or your country. It's about being part of a global enterprise of judicial thinking. These are people who care about justice. They care about getting it right. I don't think anybody on any Supreme Court doesn't think they're sincerely engaged in an enterprise of trying to get it right. They just disagree, maybe, on what that means. But this panel happens to be people that to me are the metaphors for the best the justice system delivers. I mean, Suzanne Baer and I were born in the same country. We see justice the same way because we came from that country, I think, to a large extent. I love the way she explains uh, the German constitutional system, the relationship she has with her colleagues inside the court, and we all have relationships with our colleagues inside the court. Some have more relationships than others, Elena will tell us, I'm sure. Um, but you learn how to deal with um, different relationships by hearing how they do it. Um, and she's brilliant and wise and fun. Lord Dyson, the first time I met him, I was entirely inappropriate with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> we were in the Savoy Hotel because Lord Robert Walker, who was a good friend of both of ours, took us to a dinner and he said, you've got to meet John and Jackie Dyson. They are great people. And I was sitting beside Jackie and talking to John, who was so interesting. And I don't know what it is, but a British accent makes everything sound more sophisticated. <laughs> I'll have a glass of water, please. Oh my god, that's so brilliant. <laughs> so he started talking at one point about um, his mother or grandmother being on Kastner's train in Hungary. Oh, you're Jewish? I said, and then I turned to his wife and said, is he really Jewish? He's so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> but I love you for your mind too. <laughs> <laughs> and Elena, I met you first when you were dean of the Harvard Law School and the Gruber family was giving Aaron Barak an award. Uh, you were dazzling. Every single professor in that room uh, from Harvard was talking about how you saved the law school. And you had this wry sense of humor, you were unflappable, and you were charismatically uh, chill, <laughs> I think would be the word. I think we're, we're yin and yang. But you have a passion for for intelligence and for getting it right. And I, over the years, loved your sense of humor, loved your authenticity. I always knew where I stood with you. You were always wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I admired you, and every once in a while when you did a Rosie Dyson Bear descent, I'd go, see, she's one of us. <laughs> like Janice, the labor case, that was fantastic. So um, what I admire, I think, most is that you are living, I think, until you're 107, <laughs> on a court that's not easy. We all know it's not easy because what, whether we read your decisions or not, they're in the newspaper and we do read newspapers. And the stress of living with the knowledge that you may be in dissent on cases that you care about um, for another 78 years. 
is, is a very difficult prospect, and you do it with grace, you do it with a smile, and you, you say what you think in a very elegant way. As for our moderator, Stephen Toop, when did you start dyeing your hair gray? <laughs> I met Stephen when he was a, a little professor at McGill Law School, and then he became the dean of the McGill Law School, and then he became president of uh, a university and the Trudeau Foundation, then you went off to be the president. Of course, we don't call it president of Cambridge, no, <laughs> because that would be bragging, but you were the president of Cambridge. <laughs> and I, I marveled at this Canadian just going through the academic system, but also keeping his finger on the world and doing what he could with the knowledge he had to make that word, world better. And I think, Stephen, for me, your most important contribution was I learned what international law was. So if you're mad at me for my international law judgments, it's his fault. Mm -hmm. Because he and Yuda, our wonderful dean, wrote these articles that were compelling. I thought international law was like picking up mercury. I didn't have a clue what it meant. And in early days at this global constitutionalism seminar, I mocked the presentation on international law. I said, it's not law. There's no there there. And then I read Stephen and Yuda's articles, which explained what it's for, how it should be used, and I became the person who wrote the decision in Nefsin that will never be followed by any jurisdiction <laughs> in the world. <laughs> but I came up mostly to say thank you, because you are, the four of you, people who are the, the best the justice systems around the world have to offer. You're the best people, you're the best minds, you have the biggest hearts, you're committed to the enterprise. And the enterprise is making sure the public thinks we are committed to justice, and you all are. And for that, I admire you, I love you, and I'm so grateful that you're my friend. Thank you. Rosie has just made my job very easy. She has, uh, I could, nobody could do a better round of thanks than we've just heard. Um, I think it's also very evident that one of the real perks of my role as Dean of the Law School is to be able to host an event like this and I hope that you come away sharing the joy in having such a treat um, and the kind of um, remarks that we heard and also these incisive, humorous, um, engaged conversation among people who agree on a lot of things, but not necessarily everything. Um, so before I want to close with another round of thanks and a farewell, I just want to say to those of you who are joining us for dinner at Hart House, um, you have the opportunity to walk over to Hart House and we'll reconvene over there. Um, if you need help in finding the best way across the busy road, there are student ambassadors in the lobby um, who will be very happy to guide you over there. And if there is someone here who would need transportation, we have a small number of vehicles available and here, now at the risk of sounding like an airline employee, if that is you, then please remain seated until <laughs> everybody else has left um, the forum. But most importantly, thank you all for a just wonderful um, event, and we'll see you soon again. <laughs>